On Friday, May the 28th, we learned about the 215 children who are buried in the Kamloops Residential School site. On that afternoon, Justice Murray Sinclair spoke to a group from the Antler River Watershed Regional Council, the Western Ontario Waterways Regional Council, and the Horseshoe Falls Regional Council of the United Church of Canada. He described in his low, quiet voice how Indigenous people were treated and portrayed as savages who didn't know right from wrong, how this leads to hurt, and he described his own hurt as a brilliant student who was ignored by his peers at school. He related how the government set up residential schools as training centers so Indigenous children could be taught to do menial work, but were not allowed advancement. When Indigenous children and youth overcame these limitations, new laws were passed making their participation illegal. Churches ran many of these schools. Murray Sinkler says, churches have a role to educate members about the history of residential schools. That our churches need to know and be fully immersed in the story of residential schools. That we must not forget the story and we need to advocate for change. Churches need to be, call, be there to be called upon. They need to show up. The land on which this building sits is land that has been walked on, hunted on, and lived on for thousands of years. It is the traditional land of the Wanapate First Nation and the Atikmik Anishinaabek. It is with humility and respect that we give thanks that we are here. In this space where we are in touch with the Creator who made it and who made us. May our worship honor the relationships that we are celebrated and invited here. And may we always remember the story of this land. The people who lived here and the call to live with respect and thanksgiving. We light this candle to invite the Great Spirit, our Creator, into this space to journey with us. We may be challenged. We may feel wounds opening up. But may we know that we are not alone on the journey. Let's join our voices with the leadership of Eric and James as we sing, Many and Great, O God, Are Your Works.
Good morning and welcome to St. Andrew's United Church, a community of faith in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. Thank you, Eric and James, who are our musicians today. We are truly blessed. Thank you also to Suzanne and Natasha and Sylvia, and of course, Roger and Malone, who are always the able, uh, able uh, techno technological gurus. So this is an important day for Christians across this land, as it is a day where we reflect on and give thanks for the significance of indigenous peoples who cared for this land before settlers arrived. We will pray, we'll hear readings, and watch the Sudbury premiere of a powerful film that was produced in collaboration with the Manitou Intentional Learning Community and the Regional Council Right Relations team. The readings this morning will actually come from different sources than we are usually accustomed to. These will be indigenous voices. Uh, one book, Speaking My Truth, Reflections on Reconciliation and Residential School, has a, a couple of voices, stories from there, and the book that many of us have read in this community of faith, Embers, a powerful book by Richard Wagamese. So thank you for joining us on this continued journey towards reconciliation. It is not the beginning, and it certainly is not the end. Did you know that you can actually send us messages on YouTube as you watch this video? I'd love it if you could try by posting your feelings, your thoughts on, the YouTube, uh, on this YouTube video so we can hear from you. We will be doing more of this interacting as months go ahead, but we would love to hear what you are thinking as we reflect on this very important issue of right relations with indigenous peoples. If you're joining us for the first time, we are thrilled to have you. At the end of this service, there will be information about how to contact us. You could contact us through our website, Facebook, also, there's the good old email or telephone call to Allison. If you haven't been in contact with us for a while, we miss you. We would love to hear from you, even if it's to hear that things have not been going well and we can support you. We want to know how things are going. Please reach out to us. We also have a virtual fellowship time every Sunday night at 7 o'clock. And uh, actually, in two weeks, we've got a special announcement. Uh, we're going to have a picnic at lunch hour, but we'll give you more details next week. But this tonight, we will be meeting at 7 o'clock. You need the link, so please find the uh, Diane, the name Diane, and email, and she will send you your Zoom link. Let's take a moment and just breathe. Donald, an ordained minister in the United Church of Canada and a former member of Parliament. Indian residential schools are among the most shocking and shameful realities in Canadian history. While the earliest schools predate the country of Canada itself, their full intent, impact, and reality virtually came into existence as Canada was being created. More than a hundred of these schools existed for over a century in all parts of the country, yet many people have great difficulty believing they actually existed. From the vantage point of today, one is forced to ask, how did this happen? What was in the minds of government officials and church leaders? Today, many people are frustrated in their attempt to make sense of Indian residential schools. Land claim struggles, protests, and blockades, as well as the host of third world conditions that exist for so many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people throughout this country. For some, the easiest explanation is to blame the victims. 
I believe, however, that if reconciliation is both our goal as well as our intended course of action, we cannot be satisfied with our state of ignorance and inactivity. We must begin by knowing what our real history is, what it means, and what it tells us about what we must do now. The second reading is another story from the same book, Speaking Our Truth, Reflections on Reconciliation and Residential School. Richard Wagamese writes his own story. He was a child of the 60s scoop. All of the members of my family attended residential school. They returned to the land bearing psychological, emotional, spiritual, and physical burdens that haunted them. Even my mother, despite staunch declarations that she had learned good things, there finding Jesus, learning to keep house, the gospel, she carried wounds she could not voice. Each of them has, had experienced an institution that tried to scrape the Indian off their insides, and they had come back to the bush and river raw, sore, and aching. The pain they bore was invisible and unspoken. It seeped into their spirit, oozing its poison and blinding them from the incredible healing properties within their Indian ways. The th truth of my life is that I'm an intergenerational victim of residential schools. Everything I endured until I found healing was the result of the effects of those schools. I did not hug my mother until I was 25. I did not speak my first Ojibwe word or set foot on my traditional territory until I was 26. I did not know that I had a family, a history, a culture, a source of spirituality, a cosmology, or a traditional way of living. I had no awareness that I belonged somewhere. I grew up ashamed of my native identity and the fact that I knew nothing about it. I was angry that there was no one to tell me who I was or where I had come from. Richard Wagamese became a book, film, and music reviewer, general reporter, and feature writer for numerous newspapers and journals across Canada. He had a distinguished career in journalism and became the first Indigenous person in Canada to win a National Newspapers Award. He has been listed in Canada's Who's Who. However, two years ago, he committed suicide in Western Canada. The video you are about to see was a response to the request of the Right Reverend Stan Mackay who spoke at a milk gathering, that's Manitou Intentional Learning Community, a gathering, and he requested that his honoraria go to an event at our cairn, the Apology Cairn in Sudbury. Now, COVID restrictions forced us to modify how we lived out that request. You will find the pilgrimage package on our St. Andrew's website so you can develop a deeper understanding of your role in br bringing reconciliation. Let's see the video. In August 1986, during the 31st General Council of the United Church of Canada at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario, a teepee was erected by First Nations delegates. Elder Alberta Billy, representing the All Native Circle Conference, courageously called the church to account for its complicity in the suffering of the people it claimed to love. On that night, after typical United Church discussion and voting, moderator the Right Reverend Robert Smith 
sat with elders and offered words of apology on our behalf for the ways the church had contributed to the dismantling of a sacred spiritual path and the destruction of indigenous culture. Another apology followed 12 years later, specifically for complicity in the suffering inflicted by the residential school system. As we know, apology is hollow without a conscious repairing of relationship. So to that end, the apology was received, but not accepted as complete. This cairn was built to remember the historic act and, more importantly, the commitment to reconciliation. 35 years in, we ask, how is our walk from apology to action progressing? Let's recall those historic words that light our way. To do for you a welcome song. This song was taught to us by Maggie Paul, who is a Passamaquoddy. It was given Anishinaabe words by the late Sarah Ganawabi, who is a longtime member of our group. We are singing it to you today to welcome you to this special event. Long before my people journeyed to this land, your people were here. And you received from your elders an understanding of creation and of the mystery that surrounds us that was deep and rich and to be treasured. We did not hear you when you shared your vision. In our zeal to tell you of the good news of Jesus Christ, we were closed to the value of your spirituality. We confused Western ways and culture with the depth and breadth and length and height of the gospel of Christ. We imposed our civilization as a condition of accepting the gospel. We tried to make you be like us, and in so doing, we helped to destroy the vision that made you what you were. As a result, you and we are poorer. And the image of the creator in us is twisted, blurred, and we are not what we are meant to be by God. We ask you to forgive us and to walk together with us in the spirit of Christ so that our peoples may be blessed and God's creation healed. The apology was acknowledged and received with grace to be considered by the Indigenous Church before making a response. In 1988, at the 32nd General Council, the Indigenous Church acknowledged the apology, expressing its hope that the Church would live into its words. Mrs. Edith Memnuk, a representative of the All Native Circus Circle Conference, said, The apology made to the Native people of Canada by the United Church of Canada in Sudbury in August 1986, has been a very important step forward. It is heartening to see that the United Church of Canada is a forerunner in making this apology to Native people. The All Native Circle Conference has now acknowledged your apology. Our people have continued to affirm the teachings of the Native way of life. Our spiritual teachings and values have taught us to uphold the sacred fire, to be guardians of Mother Earth, and strive to maintain harmony and peaceful coexistence with all peoples. We only ask of you to respect our sacred fire, the creation, 
and to live in peaceful coexistence with us. We recognize the hurts and feelings will continue amongst our people, but through partnership and walking hand in hand, the Indian spirit will eventually heal. Through our love, understanding and sincerity, the brotherhood and sisterhood of unity, strength and respect can be achieved. The Native people of the All Native Circle Conference hope and pray that the apology is not symbolic, but that these are the words of action and sincerity. We appreciate the freedom for culture and religious expression. In the new spirit this apology has created, let us unite our hearts and minds in the wholeness of life that the Great Spirit has given us. This exchange has been at the center of our work to make right this broken relationship, to bring about healing and new life so that both parties can walk together and with God in a good way. Maxine McVeigh has been a leader for us in that endeavor in Sudbury and beyond. She was here that night and shares the impact it has had on her life. I had the privilege of being at that 1986 General Council meeting, and I will never forget when Alberta Billy stood up and she shared her story and called on the United Church to apologize, including for our role in residential schools. I was deeply moved by her story and the pain and anguish she experienced being taken from her family, her language, and her culture. I was horrified. My church that I loved had been, had been part of an institution that had taken small children from their homes, denying them their language and their culture, leaving many parents and grandparents and whole communities sad, sad and mourning. The experience of the church's apology has flamed my passion to work for right relations, reconciliation and healing and justice for all people. I've been involved with the, with the Right Relations Committee now for about 25 years, first with Manitou Conference initially, and now as part of the team for the Right Relations Resource Team for the Canadian Chill Region. One of our goals over the years has been to provide education for our faith communities. Many of our faith communities are now acknowledging what First Nations territory their faith community is worshiping on. And another resource is a minute for right relations to promote understanding of our First Nations culture. I've always been grateful to Art Solomon and his helper Peter for the many hours of the labor and the laughter and the time spent building this memorial cairn. And that experience flames my love for my Indigenous brothers and sisters and continues to call me to continue that journey, to find ways to walk together, to respect one another, listen and learn with and from one another. Over the years, our denomination has taken steps on our journey with our First Nations brothers and sisters but we still have a long path ahead of us. Lisa Blair, Blair will now share some concrete actions that you, want, you may want to take both as individuals and communities of faith to help put the words of the apology into action. Miigwech. My name is Lisa Blair, and I'm a member of the Right Relations Resource Team and the Faith Formation and Outreach Minister at Trinity United Church in North Bay. I'm a Haudenosaunee woman living and working in North Bay, a city that is nestled between Lake Nipissing and Trout Lake, on lands and near waters that have sustained many Indigenous peoples from time immemorial to the present. Anishinaabe, Cree, 
Algonquin, Ojibwe, Métis, and in recent history, settler peoples from many different nations have called the areas in and around the Apology Cairn home. As people of the Apology, we seek to live together in peace and friendship, honoring the treaties, seeking justice, and walking together in the spirit of reconciliation. I've been asked to reflect on how we, as people of faith and people of the Apology, can put those historic words of apology into action. Here are my top five. Number one, seek out and celebrate the historic and current contributions of Indigenous peoples in your region. Artists, storytellers, knowledge keepers, athletes, leaders, and other notable people. Number two, listen and respond to the challenges that Indigenous people both on and off reserve are experiencing in your region. Number three, decolonize your relationship with Indigenous peoples. That means recognizing and valuing the knowledge and experience that Indigenous people have. Number four, become an ally and an advocate. Use your voice to uplift some of the challenges that Indigenous peoples are facing. Language, culture, land, health, all needs to be restored, both independent of and with the support of non-Indigenous people. Number five, we have already been given the framework for justice and reconciliation the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Urge our government to uphold and implement UNDRIP into law. Yawa, miigwech, merci, thank you. Now to inspire our journey, we welcome the very Reverend Jordan Cantwell. As a result, you and we are poorer and the image of the creator in us is twisted, blurred, and we are not what we are meant by God to be. This is why the work of reparations and right relationship building is essential. It is part of our healing journey, healing for settler peoples as well as Indigenous peoples. If I don't understand my own need for healing from my bondage to colonial and white supremacist attitudes, then even my best efforts at reconciliation will likely perpetuate and entrench colonial ways, not dismantle them. I must come to terms with the ways in which the image of the Creator has become twisted, blurred in me. How my participation in racist and colonial structures distorts my own humanity, as well as that of my Indigenous relatives. Once I see this truth clearly, and feel its impact on my relationship with God, myself, and my neighbors, then I will be fully invested in the transformation that needs to happen in me, in our church, and in society. Then I won't run from the hard and humbling work of building right relations, because I'll know that this is the medicine I need to heal, to become whole. This is about my liberation and your liberation. The liberation of each and every one of us, which is all bound up together. May we have the courage and the humility to embrace our healing journey, that together we may be liberated to become what we are meant by God to be.
It's all about opening. When I open myself to the world and its possibilities, even its hurts, I become whole. But when I choose to close, my life becomes fraught with struggle. Everything I do becomes about shielding myself rather than inviting good energy to fill me. Everything is energy, so I try to let the negative pass through me rather than holding on to it. You always repeat things three times. Just the important things. Why? I hear you the first time. No, you listen the first time. You hear the second time. And you feel the third time. I don't get it. When you listen, you become aware. That's for your head. When you hear, you awaken. That's for your heart. When you feel, it becomes a part of you. That's for your spirit. Three times, it's so you learn to listen with your whole being. That's how you learn. Thank you. Thank you for receiving this message today, all of you who are joining us today. Message of liberation, reconciliation. The fact that the medicines that are needed for this land begin with us decolonizing ourselves. Big words, but important concepts. Our generosity has so much possibility when we begin to do that decluttering of our hearts and our souls. So thank you for all your generosity towards St. Andrews, but I hope and pray that we all may take in this message and realize that we could be so much kinder, more just people if we listen to the voices we have heard today. I hope that you will join me as we offer our gifts, and it's not just our money gifts, but thank you for the support to the church. We need that, but as much we need your support and partnership and help as we make this journey towards reconciliation. So I invite you, I'm gonna hold my hands out, but I'm gonna hold out my hands representing, symbolizing my giving of myself and you're invited to do this as well as we pray. It is our privilege, ever creating one, to share from our individual bounties. On these plates and in our bodies are our gifts to the world. Money, commitment, thanksgiving. Thank you from the bottom of our collective hearts for all the blessings. Help us to work towards justice and reconciliation. Creator God, great spirit, whose compassion has been known in our lives more times than we can count, we open our hearts and our souls to the needs of our world. On this Indigenous Sunday, we acknowledge the great injustices perpetrated against those who lived on and cared for this land long before my ancestors and maybe your ancestors arrived. We pray that with compassion and determination, we will continue to be open to the huge impact of hearing the stories of trauma from residential schools, the 60s scoop, and the suppression of indigenous culture. Source of life, you call us to relationships rooted in equality and respect. This day we covenant to be more aware of the racism that the indigenous Métis and Inuit people of this country experience. We commit ourselves to raise our voices 
when we hear prejudiced comments, to guide others in the sacred direction of celebrating diversity that is your gift to the community. Creator God, bless us, help us, whether we identify as settlers or indigenous. Help us in our healing. Help us to feel your grace as a summer breeze on our face on a hot summer's day. As our former moderator, Jordan Cantwell, said, the path to reconciliation starts with our own healing, our own liberation from the bondage of stereotypes and colonial ways of thinking when we think about First Peoples. Surround us, God, with your love. In the quiet of our hearts and through the witness of our beings, we pray thanks for your accompaniment on the journey toward individual and communal wisdom and understanding. Let us, who are church, stand in solidarity and true to Jesus' call to reconcile with sisters and brothers. God, in this quiet moment, hear our prayers for people that we are concerned about. And I include among them Marcel and Inga and their families. We gather our many prayers together with the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Eric and James, will you lead us in our closing hymn, When Hands Reach Out Beyond Divides. Set us free. 
us free. So let us go now into another week. Go into National Indigenous Day with the words of the Honorable Murray Sinclair in our ears. He says, Churches, you have a role to educate yourselves about the history of residential schools. We are a treaty people, guided by the Creator, we will learn. Murray Sinclair calls us not just to hear the history, but to be fully immersed so that we never forget. Walking in the presence of Christ, we will earnestly seek to hear, listen, and ultimately to feel the history and our part in it as a colonizing church. He warns us to resist the temptation to fix people, but instead rebuild relationships. Finally, Sinclair says, understand, advocate, support, and show up when called upon. Holy Spirit, guide us. Grant us courage to do personal work and our collective prayer and work for reconciliation. Amen.